Okay, good morning, folks. Uh, a couple small announcements before we begin. The, the problem set is due tonight by midnight. Uh, the exam is due on, or is going to happen on Monday. Uh, Tucker and Max, the TAs are available to you. If you have any questions or concerns or whatever, reach out to them. Uh, we have a guest lecture tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time from Aaron Sather from Merck. And um, he has graciously allowed that lecture to be broadcast, although it will not be posted on YouTube. And there is content in that lecture that will be on the exam. So highly recommended you attend. And it's knowing Aaron going to be a very exciting uh, lecture. So with that, we have an action packed um, series of problems to go through today in what is probably the most difficult and confusing um, type of heterocycle that we will see until we get maybe to towards the end of this class. Uh, so this is kind of a climax of complexity and difficulty. So if you find it confusing or aggravating, it's okay, that's a natural feeling. And the best way to practice for these types of problems is to simply practice as many of them as you possibly can. Find OPRDs, JMED chem papers, find these naphtheridines on SciFinder, but don't look at how they're made. Come up with routes and then check the paper to see how your work was. Or if there's no solution out there, talk to the TAs and they can uh, guide you through your thought process. So we left off yesterday, we had skipped in the quinolin section, some real world consulting problems. And you had a lot of time to think about these. So maybe we'll just get right into it and uh, cold call someone. Uh, how about uh, Jun Chen for this first one in helping us to understand first, why is this even a consulting problem? Like what's the hardest part of this molecule? Why, why do you think that they even asked me this problem? What atom or yeah, what substituent on this quinoline makes it so difficult? I, I guess it's an amino group. Well, uh, even if the amino group wasn't there, is that that big of a problem? Mm, oh, you have, uh, how do you say that? It, you have uh, three substance uh, continuously uh, arranged. Yeah, so the biggest problem when I look at this is the methyl group. Because if that methyl group wasn't there, and they had simply proposed to us a synthesis, well, they probably would never have asked this question. How would you go about making this one? Just. That group comes from probably what? Mm, many cyclides, many annulation. Um, method. Yeah, of the type that we learned yesterday. Many ways of doing that, no regiochemical problem. But once we start putting that methyl group in, everything changes. And to make problems even worse, we've got that halogen atom there, which makes it difficult to do site-specific halogenation and subsequent cyclization. So with that methyl group, we've got to do something else. And so the suggestion here is basically to think about how we might take advantage of CH functionalization logic. So that we know is a good precursor. And in theory, if we could somehow excise that CN bond, the world would be much easier for us. So something like this, would you agree, Jun Chen, if we could figure out a way of functionalizing that position would be decent, wouldn't it? Would you agree at least on that? Well, uh, you're muted, Jun Chen. I'm gonna assume you're in agreement with I'm me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can, use, you can use a lot of ways to do that, uh, such as directing, uh, lysation maybe. Well, um, direct lithiation, perhaps, uh, but then you need to quench it with some sort of nitrogen electrophile. 
and you have the right idea. So this compound comes back from this simple material. And then we go in literature and we check and we realize, oh, there's actually a way using rhodium or cobalt and a strange species that you have never been exposed to before in this class called a diax, dioxazolone. And the dioxazolone is prone to lose CO2 to deliver a nitrine type intermediate. And that will then give you through the intermediacy this compound, which when treated with HCl delivers the product. <clears throat> How do you think you make a dioxazolone? Well, hiding in a dioxazolone is a hydroxamic acid. And if you use a phosgene equivalent like carbonyl diamidazole, that will give you your nice crystalline stable dioxazolone. Super nice convenient intermediates that can be unveiled to nitrinoid species in the presence of things like rhodium and cobalt. And you will find a paper that actually uses this as a weak pi directing group to give you that functionalization. So the point is that what one would search for are variable ways of disconnecting what is the hardest uh, CH bond or the most strategic CH bond to break. And then once you find that, that's a viable suggestion because there is no ambiguity there at all. Let's move to the next one. Uh, this next one, again, is somewhat complicated by, as Chen Chen mentioned, this arrangement of three atoms in a row. And it's probably why they asked the question because if you go to SciFinder, you won't really find anything good. So for this one, um, anyone want to offer some sort of thought? Could you start um, with? Um, what do you say, Noor? Um, could you start with the di, like the diamino uh, benzene, and then use like a vanadinium salt to install the, um, I guess. All the carbons except for the methyl group, which you can try to do like directed lithiation to install late stage. Uh, something like this with a with a Bilsmeyer. Um, so the dialdehyde equivalent that we make from the acid and uh, Biltmeyer. So you can have the halide at the, at the position that you want. Um, so, so I I'm, guess it- where, where, Where's your, I'm not seeing quite your intermediate here anymore, but it sounds good to me, but I just want to make sure I understand it. Okay, so you would have three carbon units. Okay. The middle one has the X group. And then you have um, an imine at one end and then an... So there would be a nitrogen at the last position that you had there. Like this? And then... Uh, yeah, I, I guess, yes. One of them will be analyzed, but yes. So I guess we learned that we make that from the acid and the Wiltmeyer reagent. Yes. And uh, when we stir that up with, let's say, the monoprotected amine out with pop. that compound. Right, and then you could do directed location and quenched methyl iodide. 
The only issue is, I guess, we got to make sure that thing is a chlorine. Probably, because we if we do we don't want to make we want to make sure there's no strange things going on with the direct alleviation. And I think that idea sounds pretty good. We're gonna send you a bucket load of Dogecoin for that one. That was pretty good, Nor. <clears throat> really, uh, very brilliant analysis. Yeah. Okay, you're gonna make a good consultant. Um, there's another possible way of looking at this, which is to imagine that a cyclization onto a pendant alkyne in the presence of something like I2 or ICL or maybe even a copper halide will give you the product. And obviously this is very simple to get from the corresponding analog. And you might wonder, well, Phil, how do you know the selectivity is gonna go here and not here? And we can use our handy dandy chem draw trick there we go, we do the chem draw and we see, oh, 106, 119, it should go there. And um, that's probably a very direct way to get there, but I really like what you suggested here, Noor, very, uh, very creative. <clears throat> the only ambiguity is just on the lithiation step, making sure it goes in the right spot, which it probably will you need to put a chloro there, which is okay. Um, so I'm not sure that this suggestion is not as, you know, robust as this one. Uh, you know, it might make sense to put both of those in a real world consulting session. Great job. So let's move on then to naphthyridines, which as I mentioned before, are the most confusing uh, fused heterocycle we have. And the confusion stems from what we taught you in lecture one, which is when you've got fused heterocycles and you want to come up with retrosynthetic paradigms and orders of disconnection, what often helps is to look at aromaticity as a guide. And here you've got two heterocycles that are equivalent. And so that is the most confusing part of these is that you can disconnect either way and coming up with the smartest puritine building block when you've got two options on the table. So for this first one, um, We've got two rings here, and uh, happily, Simona is going to help us out with the answer to this one. Yeah, um, well, first I want to disconnect the amide, um, and then afterwards, uh, I guess I disconnect B because um, we learn different ways to do the periodon disconnection. Um, so could you trace back to um, an amino pyridine and uh, some kind of mal malinate. So we're going to use what's become to known in this class as a Simona disconnection. And then the only potential problem one would have in a um, consulting session is they would say, hey, uh, Simona, how, you need, how do you know it's going to go here and not here? And what you would point to them is a couple of things. First, you would say, well, uh, based on the FMO prediction, you'll see that the electron density resides far more uh, here than here, number one. And number two, you would point to the preponderance of literature out there that suggests that you would get the, in these cases, the regiochemistry of cyclization always takes place at C2 or, or C6, depending on how you number. So you would be 100% right. This would work great. Uh, this just comes back from the corresponding commodity chemical by adding in a thoxide. Great, awesome, awesome, Simona. All right, how about this one from OPRD, an anti-malarial compound? This one should be pretty straightforward to disconnect. And uh, luckily Daniel will give us the first disconnection here to simplify things right off the bat. Let's just make it really simple based on what we learned in the quinoline lecture. Um, what spinach can we get rid of real quick to make things easy? Maybe that top aromatic group. Get rid of all those junk. Get rid of it. And what do you want to put in its place? 
Um, some some kind of maybe good leaving group. Okay, how about a chloro? We already learned in the last lecture that it should be very easy to differentiate. Uh, Tim taught us how to differentiate these two, remember? Okay, yeah. Right, so we're good on that. Now I just need a disconnection of something which is a lot more simple. Can we take some wisdom from what Simona just taught us? Oh yeah, I guess you can uh, have that same kind of structure as the uh, first structure you drew above, but instead of the uh, ethyl group there, you have that um, that other fuse ring. Yes, and instead of that chlorine, chlorine is just going to be a carbonyl. And if we use uh, the logic that Simona just taught us, that means the bond we're going to break is going to be right there. Perfect. And so that leads us down a road towards that. All we need to do to cyclize that is Whatever your favorite conditions are, if you could use um, PPA or use any kind of strong acid, you'll do the Friedel crafts. Why does the region of chemistry go this way? We just did the FMO theory a second ago. We just showed you and taught you that the preference for cyclization is going to be here rather than there. And then you're done. One thing I do want to note about today's lecture is because of the number of examples we're going through, we don't have a lot of time to go through the granularity of the forward route. So we're just going to be saying things like heat, acid, palladium, uh, rather than going into the details of the Ford route. And on a test, we would also make things appropriate for problems like this, where we don't, all we want is a high level of strategy. We wouldn't expect a forward route for such problems. And in an interview as well, no one's going to expect that, uh, no one's going to ask you, well, what solvent would you do the uh, acid cyclization in? They're just going to be impressed that you know the strategy of how to make it. Let's move to this epic problem. Uh, from OPRD, this is a company called Actillion. And uh, in this problem, they actually cover no less than five different routes to make a compound like this. So this one is a really intriguing one, which I'm sure we can have a very hearty discussion on. Uh, but what we need now are some general thoughts on how one might uh, put this together. And so for that, maybe we can start off with uh, Sung Han. Uh, I think I will call the theory. Uh, are yeah. there any substituent? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Keep, keep going, Sung Han. Uh, from a uh, uh, night amino purity and Right, yeah, that, like that, that's right? what I first thought, yeah. Yeah, it's a reasonable uh, suggestion for sure. It's, um, I think, totally reasonable to propose this. And um, they didn't do anything like this. But if you put something like this, like this on a test, uh, I think it would be a reasonable disconnection. You would go to the literature and you would find it's not going to be as easy as you think to do that uh, because that building block is not easily available. The condensation chemistry is not very clean. But on paper, it's reasonable. One thing that they did from the outset, which might surprise you, is they, one, in one disconnection, they decided to completely remove that methyl group because they recognized that under the proper conditions, such as what we learned in lecture number three, namely LDA and methyl iodide, you should be able to incorporate that methyl group. And um, that makes things perhaps uh, a little bit easier to uh, digest. That would be incorporated um, next to the fluorine compared to the other position. That's, yes. Yeah. Okay. Relative here, you've got two and four, and the LDA is going to give you the 
thermodynamic product, which would be C4. Oh, I meant at the other um, ring on the A ring. Chlorine is going to be a better directing group than that, than that methoxy. Yep. Great question. And so now we need to figure out a way of making that. And um, one way to think about this ring system, we, we learned from Chung Han that ring, breaking ring B would make sense. But in this case, one possible route would be to break ring A. And if you did that, it would mean you could start from a material like this. Treating this under heck conditions. We'll give you a compound like that. And then when you boil this up with acetic acid and tributylphosphine, the product you get is this. What do you think the tributylphosphine is doing in here? Kelly? Um, is it acting like as a, is doing the Michael addition to protect your regioselectivity? Well, it's, it's doing the Michael addition in order to do in situ uh, obliteration of this olefin, because right now it's in the, is a mixture of E and Z, only the Z will cyclize. And if you add in transiently the phosphine to this beta position, that's no longer an issue. So it can add in, cyclize and then retro Mount Michael of the phosphine. So that's a, a way of ensuring you get the right uh, regio, uh, the right, um, you know, a good cyclization. And in this case, it actually proceeds with 99% yield because of the addition of that tributyl phosphine. There's another way you can look at it. I'll just go through maybe one more route given the sheer number of routes presented in this study. And that is thinking about, again, doing what Sung Han said, but in a slightly different way. Imagining that on the desmethyl compound, a compound like this would give you the product fairly readily. Of course, this could be NO2. And this just comes back from here. And you could take this compound, and this is a step we are going to see over and over again, and do palladium catalyzed ethoxy vinylation. Um, and that should not be a methyl, that should be a metal. Now the metal you can imagine being tin, zinc, boron, the intermediate enol ether you then have can be subjected to <clears throat> select floor. After treatment with select floor, DMF, DMA. And then reduction of the nitro group and it cyclizes right away. Select floor is kind of expensive. So if you read this paper, you'll find that one of the things they thought about doing was disconnecting this molecule all the way back to a compound like that, which they found in a flow system could be actually treated with F2 to deliver the fluorine there. They then take this hydroxy, convert it to a bromo, and then convert that to the methyl. So if you're curious why these process chemists went through the trouble of doing all five of these different routes and uh, detailed cost analysis, I suggest you look at the original paper. It's really intriguing, uh, peering into the eyes of the real world process chemists on what you would think is a pretty simple molecule. You wouldn't think you'd need so much effort to make this, but uh, these routes that I show here were used anywhere from 25 to 100 kilogram scale. All right, let's move on to the next one.
which is this 1 8 naphthyridine. So for the 1 8 naphthyridine, luckily we are going to get some help from Brendan on this one. So Brendan, please save the day for us and give us some good disconnections for the 1 8. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, I guess if we wanted to do de novo synthesis of the ring, um, also first, I, I, I'm curious, what if you just took the 1,8 naphthyridine and then you uh, did a bischlorination and a mono SNAR, would that, would that be tractable or is, um, I mean, yeah. I understand probably you want us to disconnect the ring system, but. No, um, no, no, I, I want you to simplify it. And so you could imagine things all of this come from here. Yeah. It's actually a very clever idea. <clears throat> and then we add our nucleophile which is this thing here. Yeah, or some surrogate of it, yeah. yeah. Uh, another suggestion that you could imagine before you teach us how to make that ring would be the realization that this thing probably can come from a thalamide. So if you convert this into a thalamide and then do a mono reduction followed by an addition of an enol ether, that could be a way of making this unit from a simple thalamide. So either one of these two precursors, <clears throat> totally fine on an exam or an interview, flying colors you will pass. So why don't you give us, for example, I mean, either one, let's just do this one, same retrosynthetic analysis for either one, but how would you go about making that one? So if we break these into, if we just get rid of the, so is it possible to take the, the 1.8 naphtheridine, like if you built that, let me think. Um, so what if we took the diamino pyridine and um, yeah, maybe that chloro comes back from, uh, yeah, uh, do some annulation there. Yeah, so if you take this and you expose it to malic acid. And remember this, because we're going to see it, I think, the very first lecture when we get back from the midterm. Uh, if you treat this with acid, you get a decarboxylation, and it gives you that. Remember that. I think it's the problem of the day coming up in the future. So I'll come back to you for that, Brendan, in the future. In a few weeks, I'll be back to you. Anyway, you can make that intermediate, and that directly gives you that compound, which then you can treat with POCL3, and that gets us to that target there. Similarly, you could use the same logic. If you wanted to make uh, this dichloro compound, you could do the same thing on the chloroamino compound. No problem. Also good. Uh, but that comes out as a nice crystalline. The amino, the amino compound comes out as a nice crystalline material and very high yield. So great, awesome job, Brennan. Let's move on to some new stuff here. Uh, you know, the fun thing about the consulting corners is that there is no final solution for these. So these are things that were proposed many years ago. I don't know what the consequences of these suggestions are. And they were suggested because there is nothing really, it's well, the reason they asked them is there's nothing in SciFinder, there's nowhere to, you know, begin. So that's why they would ask a question like this. Um, so what kind of things are we going to be thinking about when we look at uh, a compound like this? Maybe uh, Carter can sort of give us some general thoughts on what, what you might think about in a suggestion like this when SciFinder comes up with nothing. Uh, I was first looking at the uh, anhydride. Okay, what do you want to do with that? Drawing that back from some sort of dehydrative cyclization. Okay, now how do we make that thing? Uh, could you start from a two amino four uh, carboxyl pyridine? And what would you like to do? Um, 
if what, we could. What you need to do. What you need to do here, Carter, as I'm sure you're trying to think through right now, is basically annulate here, aren't you? Right? Yes. That's the natural consequence of what you just drew. You're going to have to do that. So how do we, what would be conditions you think that would be a viable way of potentially stitching these two things together that we learned from lecture number three? Um. I guess, is it, so is it not activated just to add in? Can't add in, because we got this annoying electron withdrawing group. Kind of dumbs down oh, I see. all the Friedel craft ability. All the Friedel craft ability of this is kind of shut down with that annoying ester. Um, we got to do something a little more harsh to uh, get that carbon carbon bond to form. Any suggestions? Could you go the opposite way and deprotonate at yeah, the Yeah, exactly. Yes, perfect. So we're going to take a PIV or a BOC, throw it on the nitrogen, make the anion, and potentially add it to a species like this, which would give the product. We, if that didn't work for some reason, you could recommend to the chemist to maybe use the methyl product. And that would most certainly deliver this compound. And subsequently, you would simply need to oxidize that up, of which there are many ways of doing it. Something like CAMNO4 would work. Uh, there's electrochemical solutions. There's radical-based solutions. But these four methylpyridines are very easy to oxidize. Using the same logic, you might also go into that room and say, hey, we can do this twice. So another viable suggestion to give them as a backup plan might be one like this where you do a double oxidation of those easy to oxidize methyl groups, and then it rapidly cyclizes. And this one you can imagine coming back from kind of similar logic. It's going back to our uh, Quinlan lecture, really. go in side finder and find very quickly that this compound is very, very cheap. You can imagine doing a heck reaction with this, followed by cyclization. So the heck gives you that CC bond. You then cyclize here, no problem. You treat it with POCl3 and then reduction. And we get to there all viable suggestions. You usually want to go in that room with multiple plan Bs in case the first, the first thing you suggested here, which is brilliant, Carter. Awesome, awesome job on that. Uh, but there's a little backup plan for you with the recognition that we can oxidize those methyl groups very easily if this initial best suggestion that you had here didn't work. Great. Um, well, maybe if you're feeling so confident here, Carter, on this one, you could even go to the next one. This one may be even, even simpler to, to imagine. Um, okay, so based on kind of previous things we've done, maybe the chloro can come back from a carboxyl or a, a carbonyl. And then? Um, if the other ring, remember the trick we learned yesterday or Wednesday if, or Monday, when was it? Monday. If the other trick we learned, if we just pretend this is benzene, remember that trick? Mm -hmm. If it was just benzene, what would you do? Um, just take like the aniline. Yeah. And so no hesitation then, don't hesitate.
That's a Combs reaction, isn't it? Definitely worth proposing. If they say, oh, Carter, that's not working. There's some issue with it. You can go back to the Quinlan playbook and simply propose something like, A Friedlander type. Mix those two together. That's precedented on that theorines, in fact. So either of these suggestions are good. Happy with that, Carter? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, great job. I have questions about thinking about uh, strategizing for this. So, like a lot of times when I look at these, I get very caught up in wanting to think about substitution rather than ring synthesis. You're not alone. So tell us, give us an example of, of what kind of, where that comes into play in the, in the problems we've just covered. So for the one that we just did with this chlorine on it, like it makes me feel like, well, if you can just start with no substitution on it at all, you can direct to get something at C4. And as long as you can do that mono, right? And you just end up with one chlorine on the ring. Yep. And then you can put in some other group um yeah, now that's great i'm so happy you got you've gone down this path alex let's imagine you do find some way to put the chlorine in there at that position selectively mm -hmm. how do you then control where the next group is going to go relative to the three other spots that could potentially be unlocked yeah so i guess for this one so because this is a chlorine it's making it weird but like had that been a bromine then i would have wanted to do like would that direct to putting it at the C3? Uh, well, we don't, we need, so let me just number it because I'm not sure. I get Sorry, it. yeah. Okay, what do you mean now? So if you had put um, a halogen at it at what you have labeled as C4, okay, okay. You, could you could get that to direct to C3 now, right? To functionalize at C3. All right, okay. Perhaps. Then you can use that to do C2. So now you've gone around in your little ring and in this particular problem, I guess this is not great because you have a chlorine, yes. but if that were a bromine, let's say at C4, okay. then you could clear the chlorine at C3 and then you could have what you want just through substitution rather than ring synthesis. Well, if you had, even if you had a bromine, it's gonna be hard to do desch-chlorination in the presence of a very highly activated bromine in this position. Okay. You're not gonna be able to do that. The bromine always goes first. The only way the bromine wouldn't go first is if the bromine was at C3 and the chlorine were at C4. Then you could take advantage of maybe I see. reducing I see. it. But I'm really happy you went down this road. In my experience, uh, I would say for naphthyridine consulting questions and synthesis in the real world, it's 85% synthesis. And then 15% or less even. You can't really buy many naphthyridines. If you look, they're all obscenely priced. And people often have, a, they're, they're really hard to manipulate in a Regis-selective fashion. So I would say if you see a naphthyridine on a test or in an interview, resist the urge to do substitution, except if you're just doing some menial substitution at the end. Like for instance, what we saw here, where at the end, these folks decided to do a lithiation there, or they decided to do in the case of this route, they decided to do a fluorination at that position, right? So very menial, simple electrophilic things or a lithiation that's very clear, cut and dry, but that's it. I never see people start from the parent naphthyridines in the way you could potentially start with a parent pyridine. So that's why we're covering all these syntheses at a high level strategically because that's what you see on naphthyridines. That's great. Yeah, you don't do much ring substitution, really. Awesome, great question. All right, uh, let's move on to problem of the day number one. This one looks pretty easy. It's, it's a 1,6 naphthyridine and um, perhaps uh, Nathan, if he's in the line, can help us out with this one. Um, can you start with a four amino pyridine? Oh, I guess I was thinking of disconnecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're fine. You're fine. I'm just uh, drawing out your logic. So you're saying to disconnect, um, start with B and annulate on A. 
And what are your conditions to go there? Uh, Any you can reagents? like you can do um, some sort of uh, annulation with like a micro acceptor. Yeah, for instance, Sprout would be fine. That usually gives around you know forty or fifty percent yield. Perfect. That's brilliant. But is the other way also viable? Uh, I would think so. And so if you think it is viable, can you help us with coming up with a, uh, a disconnection to make it so? Uh, let's see. So now we're going to start A, go on to B. Put my starting material here. And I just need a substituent at the two and the three position to help me through this. So can you start with a um, two chloro three uh, CHL? Brilliant. We're going to take this compound. And uh, this compound will then cyclize. We can cyclize it halogenatively. Uh, we can cyclize it um, in a neutral fashion. And that will give us directly the desired product. This is straight out of the playbook we saw on Monday, isn't it? In this case, here you were using quinoline, quinoline notes. And here you were using the isoquinoline notes. Go back to your notes from Monday. It's identical. The only thing I did is I put a nasty little nitrogen atom there to make it confuse, confuse you. But if you do this trick on naphtheridines, pretend one is a benzene ring and the other one is your quinoline or isoquinoline, that is a very fast way to remove complexity in naphtheridines, as Nathan has just taught us. So in, in a matter of 15 seconds, he got the answers. Phil, I just want to clarify. Um... So doing like a Pomerantz Fritz uh, here would be an issue just because of free selectivity, right? Of that annulation step. That, that just want to, sorry. Ah, so the Pomerantz Fritz would require some sort of. Or if you had the aldehyde there, like if you had the uh, same intermediate as Nathan, just without the chloro. And then what conditions? And then uh, add the amine with um, the amino uh, acetal. Yeah. <clears throat> there is the regiochemistry issue. Um, you might get lucky. Normally, you really get a high C2 selectivity when there's some sort of heteratom here. Um, but I'm not sure that we could count that one out. Um, it's definitely one that you could propose or at least check uh, the precedent on SciFinder for that not being there. So that's definitely a viable disconnection. It's a great one to have in mind when you start having maybe other halogens here. What if there's another halogen here and you can't do Sonigashiro? Or what if there's a group here where there's no regiochemical problem? So Pomeranz Fritsch is a great one to have in your back pocket. And I think if you propose that one in the test, we couldn't mark any problem, anything wrong with it. Yeah, the, like we said, the only issue might be it's a little electron deficient, but if you heat it up really high, you might, you may be okay. It, that's the only, only quagmire you'd have there. It's not ideal for a consulting session just because you wanna you know, give them the guaranteed suggestion, but it's reasonable. Great. All right. How about the next one here? And maybe for this one, Ellie can give us a, a thought on how we might be able to put this thing together pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I I don't know if this is right, but it kind of reminds me of the Goreshi Thor, like with the oh, wow. pattern. That's pretty awesome. So Goreshi Thor just does this, doesn't it? Yep.
Awesome. Brilliant. Not intimidated at all by that map theory. <clears throat> Fantastic. Let's move on to some real world consulting problems. So um, for this one, uh, we need um, some pretty deep thinkers. And um, so maybe Alex can help us out with a disconnection strategy for this one, noting that very annoying iodide, which is going to prevent you from doing something that you might want to do. Right. Um... So disconnecting that is problematic. Um, that always makes me want to bring it back to like an alkyne. Yeah, uh, most people want to bring it back to an alkyne and that's uh, part of the problem. So one solution would be to put some protected iodide here. What would be a good protecting group for an iodide? All of these could be reduced, sandmired, or just sandmired. But mm, that's not that's not as direct as we might want, is it? So we hear you loud and clear. There's a large desire to do Lorac, and you could get around it by doing that. And I suppose you we couldn't count off too many points on the test for that, even though in the real world, mm, it's not ideal. Is there some way of capitalizing on innate reactivity here that we might be able to put this thing together much quicker without the use of any kind of transition metal? Well, can we do a courteous rearrangement to, to construct the B ring? Courteous rearrangement to construct the B ring? Is that what? Yeah. Uh, you're suggesting? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, the courteous, courteous. I assume you meant men is right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, how do we make that? Uh, from a, a ester on the benzene position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we do this? Uh, you, you may. Uh, the only issue is making this may not be the happiest thing, although I suppose you could just take um, something like this and uh, under the right lithiation conditions. Uh, but we, if we do the courteous rearrangement, we don't need an ester on pyridine. Ah, we need to find a way to, you know, this would need to be a differentiated ester. So maybe we'll put a T-butyl ester there so we can deprotect that without touching the other one. Is that what you want? No, no, I mean, we do not have a ester on the pyridine. Oh, yes, that's a, oh yeah. So, you know, after a courteous, you could imagine getting the NH2, but what you get before the hydrolysis of the NH2 would actually be the isocyanate. Yes. So that's a very brilliant suggestion. So you just want to get your carbon from there. Um, and this just comes back from that kind. Is that the idea? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. The only potential quagmire here is whether that nitrogen could cyclize here to give you a bridged heterocycle. That's probably going to be the end of that route. Bridged heterocycles we'll learn about in um, the next, after the midterm, but that's the potential problem there. Okay. There's, but, but it's a good suggestion. I mean, you know, prior to the midterm, you suggest that we can't really count it wrong because we haven't taught you about bridged heterocycles yet. So there's another way of disconnecting this that is kind of simple, um, and it just takes advantage of the innate reactivity of a two methyl pyridine. 
treat these two with LDA and you get what's known as a Hauser type annulation. Done. One step and it's modular. So you can buy a hundred different halogenated nitriles and uh, deprotonate, work up, you get that compound and you're done. Great. All right, let's move on to this uh, interesting consulting problem. Uh, this one may be, may be quite challenging. And you'll find nothing like this in SciFinder. So we need a, a direct way to think about how we might be able to put this together. <clears throat> and for this, maybe we can get the help of Noor. Um, I guess I'd remove the amine to the, the put a chloro there in an SNER type. Okay. Now um, what? Good question. Um, well, I I think I'll I'd start chopping up the airing so it start with the four amino um, pyridine and uh, I guess try to react that with the alpha beta with the um, essentially the alkyne that's dependent to an ester. This type of thing? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the only issue of course is gonna be <laughs> your regiochemistry. Yeah. Right, so it's a good suggestion. It's one that you could, you know, if you're preparing for a consulting session, you could see what kind of precedents out there. Are we going to get the right regiochemistry? Maybe you can find a way to selectively halogenate, put a bromine here, and then do some uh, palladium chemistry to get in the that to go. It's certainly great. It's it's definitely a good one to think about. But the question is, is there a way to disconnect this without necessarily relying on SciFinder coming to your rescue. What if we do A to B? What kind of disconnection can you be almost certain just on first principles is probably going to work out for you? Um, so I guess one thing that's the pops is that you could start with the uh, pyridone. Okay. Um, and then I could, oh, actually I meant the other side. On the, so like if you um, break the B ring and just start with the simple pyridone on the A ring. You can use the, the nucleophilicity of the imine type uh, double bond um, to, um, it's, I'm, I'm thinking of annulating like a, and an my type, so like, I don't know, picking something along the lines of... Uh, and what Sung Han showed us before? Uh, I, I was more thinking of, well, because that double bond would be activated at the, the other position, not the one you showed. Okay. So I could append like an ester type, and then um, I guess deprotonate the two position and append something that could give me the rest of the two carbons. Ah. I love what you're saying there, Noor. You identified some sort of group here that would deprotonate. Let's stick with that logic, but not make things so complicated with the pyridone that you have to make. Let's do exactly what you just said, but in a slightly different context. And you tell me what you think of it. Now, all we have to do is treat this with DMF, DMA. And when we treat this with, let's say, HBR or HCl,
how pops product. But based on your recognition of that's going to be acidic, we end up with that. And where does this thing come from? Well, um, this just comes back from a simple or purity. What do you think, Noor? That looks good. <laughs> I think it, feel, it, feels, it feels good. Right? Yeah. And the closure of the nitrile, you could imagine there's other things we could do too. So if you close this, you could, if you treated it with ammonia, let's say, the, that would give you a product like this, which you could propose no problem to do um, reductive amination on or Sandmeyer to give the chloro. So all of that is just fine. But as we taught you on Monday, when you take these kinds of nitriles, you treat them with dry uh, acid, they will give you directly those halogenated compounds. We're gonna see a few more examples of that this morning. All right, so let's move on to the 1,7. And for the 1,7, we've got a nice cage match between process chemists and medicinal chemists. So for the medicinal chemists, we have many on this call. Let's see if um, Nick or Fang are on the line. If not, we'll Go to someone else. Are either of you on? Okay. If not, how about Sung Han? Again, oh, As I want your I want your med chem route, not your process route. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is med chem route, but I think in the last class you mentioned a thiocyano molecule. Yeah, so if we treat them with the HBR and stabilize. And then? Yeah, so one of the bromine can do coupling reaction and another maybe a Sandmeyer reaction yeah. to put the substitute on right side. Brilliant, perfect, Sung Han, love it. It's a perfect med chem route because we've got perfect modularity. This thing just comes back from this by a radical bromination, KCN addition, and now we've got our dinitrile. We treat that with HBR. It cleanly uh, initiates with the bromide, adding in to the more electron deficient nitrile, closing up, we get this compound, Happily, we'll undergo Suzuki, switch that off to a uh, halogen or a triflate. Either one can be done with Sandmeyer, and then Nagishi to your heart's content. That's a fantastic medchem route. But now we've identified after a thousand analogs, the Novartis med chemists hand this over the fence to the process chemists. And uh, obviously, they're probably going to want to avoid things like Sandmeyer, uh, maybe minimize the amount of. Um, cross coupling that they do. Uh, so why don't you? Uh, uh, we need a process chemist. So how about um, the, from the process chemist column? Maybe Simona can help us out with what is now your way to get this compound? I don't care about modularity anymore. Um, can you? Can you maybe? instead of doing all that cross coupling late stage can you install those fragments earlier on and then do like a cyclization Aha. so you're invoking one five dicarbonyl logic aren't you yeah Great. so the first thing you draw um, roughly 30 seconds before they give you your offer letter at whatever company is that and everyone's happy. They say, wow, that's exactly the way to think. And so how do we actually do this in principle? In, in the real world, the way they start is from that. 
You can then treat this with base, it will lithiate. Um, you can then quench that with the corresponding ester acid. You can then treat this with really a whole host of things. It can be PPA or PLCL3. Let's just use PLCL3 just for clarity. And then a super simple Suzuki uh, to give you the product. So where do you get this thing from? It's just from a Ritter reaction. How do you like that? That's the great disconnection, which leads us down a road of thinking about how we can get that very quickly, realizing then that the first bond we can make is this one very easily. We need this NHT butyl to direct cleanly that lithiation of a C3 methyl group, which is not innately primed for deprotonation. And then a super cheap Suzuki because it's pretty straightforward to get this boronic acid. So they've cut it down from an annoying Sandmeyer Nagishi Suzuki to simple lithiation condensation, followed by one rather cheap Suzuki. Great, awesome job. All right, let's move on to the two seven. The two sevens are fun because now we've got embedded in this compound two isoquinolins. So this AKT inhibitor from AstraZeneca, maybe Debbie can help us with how we might rationalize putting this strange compound together. And it is MedCamp. And let's see, if Debbie's not online, we can move to, uh, let's go back to Tim. Yeah, okay, so um, my first thought would be to start with uh, the cyano, or like I would annulate B onto A. Um, so I guess if I'm starting with the pyridine at C3, I would start with the cyanide. And then at C4, um, you could start with a, a methyl or um, and, or one of those, or the phenyl or a ketone, I'm, I'm having a little trouble trying to map it out, um, one sec. And so what we need to do somehow, or let's say, you know, what? Let's make, we don't need the ketone. We can imagine if we had this compound and we, let's say, um, treated that with AR aldehyde. Would that get us there? Or not aldehyde, uh, but rather the, let's say the wine red. That's kind of what your disconnection leads us down to, isn't it? Yeah. I don't see um, really a problem with this rel. The only thing I have a problem with is I'm in med camp. And as a medicinal chemist, if I want to make 100 analogs here and 100 analogs here, do I want to be making the ring every time I do this? I would rather have a way of doing dumpster couple one and then couple two and I'm done. So while there's nothing wrong with your route here, maybe for process chemistry, this might be good, perhaps. Uh, it falls short of being as ideally modular as I would want because obviously I'm gonna to wanna to search SAR on that phenyl all day. And I don't wanna make a new phenyl cyanopyridine every time I need a new analog. So is there another modular way you could imagine getting us back? The key is just pretend A is benzene. 
So if A is benzene and we're dealing with an isoquinoline, we can be doing what we did over and over and over again on Monday, which is just to imagine that we've got that. That then can be cyclized with uh, you know, copper chloride, whatever you want. Then do your next cross coupling to get your product. Highly modular way of doing that. Where do you get this thing from? Dirt cheap. What do you think of that, Tim? For MedChem, pretty good, right? It's not bad. Not bad. But it's okay. You're a radiochemist. So, all right, let's move on to this next one. This one looks kind of simple. Maybe it's a mistake. Can we come up with a super fast way of making this one? Uh, Tiffany, any suggestions for a uh, two minute retrosynthesis of this compound? Or uh, Aaron or Camille. Um, could you start with um, the B ring and then a, a cyanide coming off? And um, what do you want to put here? Um, We could do what, what Brendan said. After we take that cyanide and reduce it, we could do his Pomerantz fridge, perhaps. Yes? Yeah, I think the nitrogen's in the wrong place. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that's a, a good way of thinking about taking B and then throwing A on. Uh, is there a way of taking A and throwing B on? If we DMF, do DMA. What, what uh, DMF, DMA? Yeah, so at C2, the nitro LC3 methyl, um, DMF, DMA, quench with HCl, HCl. That's looking good. That will work. That's probably a, a very fast and simple way to go. Um, liking that a lot. Great. Is there another way to think about this? We could we do what could we do the Sun Han maneuver? Maybe, maybe this would work. Sung Han, do you, do you like that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you put it on a test, can't really uh, fault you for it. Uh, but if I had to go to the lab and do it myself, I would probably go straight for that. All right, fantastic. So let's move on then to this interesting problem straight out of the real world. And uh, for this one, hopefully, uh, Stone can come to the rescue and uh, help us with this strange brominated naphtheridium. We're running low on time, so there's not going to be a lot of time here. Uh, a quick suggestion would be good, and I'll give you a hint. It's very similar to what we just saw. Uh, SNIR to get on the um, amine. And then disconnect to the pyridone. You want, you want to remove the benzyl? 
Oh, sorry. Um, the chloride to the pyridine. Chloride to the pyridone. Okay. Um, now what? Um, I'm thinking courteous, but there's radio selectivity issues. Yep, probably would, could be a big problem, that one. Did we do what we did over here? In the... This would work fine, wouldn't it? There you go. Happy with that, Stone? Yeah. Yeah, looks good. Let's go to this 2,6 compound. So the 2,6 isomer. Uh, this one is a JMED chem problem, and I think we can address it with lightning speed based on what we've already seen, based on what, um, again, Sung Han taught us. Uh, so who was listening to Sung Han? Uh, Daniel, can you give us a two-second retrosynthesis of this compound? Um, so maybe you can do that same SNAR from the, uh, on the uh, B ring from some halogen, and then you can bring in the aryl group uh, medchem. I guess through Suzuki coupling from a different halogen, perhaps. Uh, so how about that different halogen? It's just this. And then after we're done with the first one, we do a Sandmeyer followed by Suzuki. So how do you make that? What is this carbon, Daniel? Uh, an acid. So nitrogen, carbon, another nitrogen. What is that? This, uh, something is hiding in there. Never forget when you see that motif, that is a nitrile hiding. And here it is. Okay. Done. Where does this come from? Again, the same thing. NBS followed by cyanide displacement. Treat this with uh, HBR or HCl and then you'll get your X group there. Do your first um, uh, SNAR reaction followed by a Sandmeyer and then do your Suzuki and you're done. That's exactly how they did it. And we are doing great on time. So let's move on to another consulting corner from the real world. Oh, this was many, many years ago. Uh, none of these compounds can be found in SciFinder. Can be pretty tricky. So we need some real deep thinkers here to help us through this for some uh, large fistfuls full of pyridoge coming your way if you can solve this. Anyone want to take a crack at any of these? Yeah, for the first one, could you trace it back to one of those dicyano compounds if you go through um, the pyridone um, and then disconnect? Um, so disconnect the B ring by um, using POBR3 Um, and then, yeah, tracing back to the dicyano from there. This. Oh, sorry, I had the isomer wrong. This compound, essentially, right? Yeah. And this comes back from... What exactly? Well, 
I guess I yeah I wanted to have two nitriles, but maybe that's not the right mapping. Well, if you treat, let's say, what happens if you treat this with HBr? What happens? We're going to get. that. So you're going to have to burn off. You need to burn off this bromo and then do a Sandmeyer there. Yeah. So you're not wrong. Um, it's not necessarily the most ideal uh, disconnection for someone in MedChem that you want to get to the product right away. The lesson of this consulting corner really is to think about in making these types of uh, systems, think about Friedlander. So I'll to give you a second to go back to your notes on Monday. And the Friedlander is a useful reaction for making quinolins, right? So the first thing we're gonna do in all of these, all of these became really difficult because of this acid. So for all of them, the disconnection approach that is logical is to get rid of that. Let's instead in its wake, put a methyl because we know it's going to be very easy to oxidize that methyl group. And then watch what happens to the rest of the disconnection. Now we have a methyl, we know that's super easy to oxidize up. And then if I look at this with my eye and I say, oh, this is just that kind no nitrogen. Okay, I'm imagining it's just a quinoline. If it's just a quinoline, Simona, and I'm using some sort of Friedlander, what do I do? Uh, well, you need um, a dot, or sorry. You need a ketone and um, uh, disconnect at the aniline with um, a ketone hanging off there as well. That gets us to that. This you'll search inside Finder and find is commercial, but it can also be made through bromination. And apparently the bromination has high selectivity for that position, which you can also predict based on proton shifts in your chemdro. So that comes from the corresponding um, uh, halogenated compound. How do we go from here to here? Just uh, acid aldehyde and base. Friedlander is a super useful way of making these types of naphthyridines. You see this a lot in literature. How do you make uh, those methyl ketones? Well, this one happens to be commercial, but ones that arise from these other types of substitution patterns may be less. So let's use the same Friedlander logic for this next one. This next one then derives itself simply from that. And in the forward route, what we're going to do is first the conditions we saw at the very beginning of the class, the foxy vinylation with palladium. We know from our handy rules that we're going to get selectivity up to hydrolysis and get the methyl ketone. And then one reduction to Friedlander, and then three oxidation of the methyl group. Same exact strategy with the other isomer. Med chemists love it when you give them the exact same route for all the compounds. All these regioisomers you would think might require all their own different routes, but conceptually all the routes are very, very similar and the conditions are all going to be doing the same thing over and over again, which will help them when they want to actually troubleshoot reactions that are not going so well. So same thing, that compound can be ethoxyvinylated. After hydrolysis, you end up with that. Same thing again. Greenlander, oxidation, you get your product. So from problem of the day number two, this consulting box, what you need to remember is Friedlander for these types of naphthyridines, looking for 
the hidden quinolone. Now, I'm certain that if we had to try to start with A and fuse on B, you might be able to come up with a route to do that. Uh, we saw Simona's idea here, which is, is definitely proposable, right? I mean, if you put this on, the, on a test, we really can't fault you. I mean, let's go back to her key intermediate. How would you make it? You would make it from that. So you're fine. If you want to do that on a test, Simona, you're fine, right? You would add in your nitrile. You would do a radical bromination, another nitrile here. You would treat it with acid. You would get out that. And then you would simply do a little functional group shuffling. Nitrogen goes to the bromine, and the bromine departs before you do the sandmire. So nothing wrong with your suggestion. Just these other routes are a little bit uh, more direct. Or maybe your route is actually better, because maybe someone would argue, hey, I don't want to do that methyl oxidation at the end. So although I'm telling you there's a lot of precedent for doing that kind of methyl oxidation. All right, great. So we have exactly 10 minutes left to cover this very interesting natural product called amphetamine. Uh, and, Amphimedine. And amphimedine can be made uh, by two different routes. The first one is not surprisingly uh, using a stilly coupling from the stilly group. And in terms of the overall disconnection, the sort of brilliant stroke of wisdom from stilly's plan is that you could annulate on a ring system here by doing a as a deals alder reaction. So they start from this azadine, which kind of looks like an aza Danishevsky dine. And um, after Deals Alder, we'll give you your um, pyridone, which can be methylated. You'll note that the hiding naphtheridine in this structure here can be forged using the strategy by simply removing the TFA group that then swings around here and condenses to the problem. So how do we make this? Well, in stilly logic land, it's clear that the way we're going to make this is simply from the corresponding halogenated compound. So PLCL3 followed by stilly. And then there's another route uh, from Nakahara, not in JAX, but in heterocycles, where they use a, a disconnection that you already thought of uh, and you proposed before. So one could imagine simply disconnecting this compound by way of this aniline plus some sort of precursor like that. No need for a stilly or any kind of cross coupling. So definitely the process route to make something like that would be really what you see there. Now, the other synthesis we'll cover is a one from uh, the Prager group, which we will go through in a stepwise fashion as shown below. But the key sort of insight for this Prager strategy is to disconnect this key bond here. Once we disconnect that key bond, Got our naphtheridine hiding. We have here a cyano group. And we have here our AR. So our Frito crafts happen at the very end at the spot which is electronically activated, as Nor taught us earlier for a pyridone. So that key bond gets us to something simplified, which then sets a stage for the final synthesis, which we have time in the last six minutes to cover. 
So when we take a fluorinone and we treat it first with uh, TMS chloride and triethylamine, what is going to happen here, Kelly? That's going to protect your pyridone. Great. And then what? Um, and then your lithiated species will add into your ketone. And after workup, that TMS will just wastefully depart, won't it? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and well, since you're already on the, you're already speaking, maybe you can just help us with problem today number three, the last one of the class today. Sure. Um, so in the presence of strong acid, you get elimination of your alcohol. And what happens after that while I'm drawing? And then you can add your azide in at that position. Now what do I do? Um, then you need uh, migration and to kick out nitrogen. Hmm. Interesting suggestion you have there, Kelly. Um, I've got three CC bonds here that I can put my coaching on. And to be clear, you know, something's going to migrate here and kick out nitrogen, of course. So uh, what, how do we, which one is going to be the one? Um, I think it's going to be a, because it's most electron rich. Okay. So it has the best migratory aptitude. Let's draw the AR. So that's our product, right, Kelly? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. All right. Now, in order to finish this up, we treat this with PCL5, POCL3. Um, let's see, uh, Carter. What what happens with um, with that? What is this molecule going to do when you treat with PCL5, POCL3? Um, act on that pyridone. Brilliant. Then what? Methyl triplate. What do I do there? Um, let's see. I guess you have several pyridine like nitrogens. Mm, yes, I do. Maybe I should draw the other one. I've got this one here too. Gee, that's confusing. Um, got a great alkylating agent. Which of the sites is going to be alkylated? I would say based on lecture one or two. I think it was three. Oh, uh, um. Well, you know what? Maybe it was lecture five. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to YouTube real quick and check it out. So. <laughs> uh, maybe the one next to the chloro. OK, we've got A, B, and C. And Carter is voting on A to be methyl triplate adding into. Um, so what do we think about that? I think I might change my vote. To what? To C. Because? Um, well, the, the, I would imagine the chloro is a bit deactivating. Exactly. And as we learned in that lecture, when everybody voted, it was a very controversial vote, a lot of hanging chads. We needed to recount for a half an hour. But finally, at the end of it, uh, we all voted that the sterics would guide 
the direction. And so we know now that um, we'll get hysterically guided uh, methylation or alkylation to get the pyridinium here. And after that, we treat this with KOH and ferrocyanide, which is a great way of taking that pyridinium and turning it into a pyridone. Subsequently, all we need to do to finish this story, we've got this chloro hanging here and copper cyanide comes to the rescue. And that gives us uh, compound A, which if we scoot way back over here, where is this? There you go, treat that with PPA and you are all done. And so we, we, we are also all done and we are right on time. I don't think we skipped anything today. So I wish you all a lot of good luck on the midterm. It should be fun. It should be realistic. And don't forget tomorrow we have this amazing guest lecture, Aaron Sather from Merck, and that will be 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you're a auditor or a visitor, Max will be able to send you a link for that as well. It won't be on YouTube, but everybody is invited. So have a great rest of the day and we'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m.